This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Along the U.S.-Canada border, up in the northeastern Arrowhead region of Minnesota, lies the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. With over 1 million acres, 1,000 pristine lakes, 1,200 miles of canoe routes, and 2,200 backcountry campsites, the Boundary Waters is an outdoorsman's paradise. Barry Johnson has visited the Boundary Waters many times over the past 25 years and has published a collection of real-life stories of adventure in the Boundary Waters titled The BWCA Reader. You can learn more at bwcareader.com. Barry Johnson, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to talk with you. Barry, if you were telling somebody about your book and they have never heard of the Boundary Waters, how would you describe it to them? I would describe it as a huge chunk of pristine wilderness in the U.S., probably some of the most pristine wilderness in the continental U.S., um, over a million acres where there's no roads, there's no cars, and there's very few people. How did the BWCA come into being? Well, back in the 1920s, there was a guy, he was an industrialist. His name was uh, Edward Backus. And he had, he had operated some hydroelectric dams in Canada, and he proposed a plan the dam to create seven new dams in the BWCA area, essentially to create a water holding pond, big water holding area for his hydroelectric dams. Now, this plan would have flooded much of what the current BWCA is, and the fledgling environmental movement uh, rose up and fought the plan and stopped it, led by a, a great great guy named Ernest Oberholzer, uh, oftentimes referred to as the father of the BWCA. You know, I've lived in Minnesota for 10 years, and I've never been to the Boundary Waters. After reading your book, I know I've got to go up there, but I can't imagine what it would be like if there was a bunch of dams up there. It would, uh, you know, they did studies at the time. Not only would it have flooded a lot of the great natural features, some of the canyons and waterfalls and, uh, and lake levels would have been very, very high. So the BWCA, as we know it, wouldn't exist. But worse yet was the water would fluctuate. It would go up and it would go down. And so all of the lakes would essentially been, at times of the year, have been lined with shorelines of mud. It really, And then there was also plans along with that to, develop a lot of the area into more of a modern-day recreational area with motorized boats and hotels and uh, fishing camps. So it would have changed the face of the BWCA forever. Thankfully, it didn't happen. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that uh, in the book, I include a, uh, excerpts from an invitation from this guy, Edward Backus, this industrialist, to some of the newsprint you know, he, he used the dams to create pulp mills and create newsprint. And he had a uh, junket in 1927 for some of his newsprint customers. And um, you can tell he was a pretty high-flying guy, and he was whining and dining these folks. So the fact that these in, these uh, in this fledgling environmentalist movement was able to stop him is pretty amazing. Now, Barry, how did you get the idea... For this book, how did the whole thing get started? Well, Paul, I've been I've been going up there for decades, and I really enjoy it. And it seems like every time I go up there, I'll meet somebody new who has a great story to tell. I've I've spoken with outfitters over the years who each have numerous great stories to tell. So over the years, I just learned that people have these wonderful stories about accidents or you know wonderful things they saw wildlife they saw, fish they caught, incidents that, you know, um, incidents that might have happened along a portage trail or at a campsite. And I thought, this is too good. This is just a lot of rich material. And, uh, and I wanted to help these folks tell those stories. So how did you go about putting it together? How did you put the word out that you were looking for stories? 
the idea came together in my head. I uh, put together a website, and then I did a lot of promotion using social media, using snail mail, using word of mouth. I talked to outfitters. I talked to um, groups and clubs that sponsor outings into the BWCA. And I just put the word out that I wanted to share these tales. I also offered a $250 cash prize to you know, what was judged to be the best essay overall. And as I said, there's a lot, there's about 250,000 visitors a year to the BWCA. There's a lot of tales to be told. And I got about 500 essays submitted. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, it was great. People are very passionate about their BWCA stories. So how long from start to finish did it take to, I guess, from when you uh, started putting the word out for you want to collect stories to when you had it a published copy in your hand? How long was that? Well, I'd say the idea percolated around in my head for about six months before I got serious and really got to work on it. And between really getting the website launched and publishing was about a year. Some of the content that you have in the book is uh, reprinted material from canoeing magazines and so forth. How difficult was it to get that content into your book? Well, I really, really targeted um, a handful of authors who are pretty famous for their BWCA travels. I reached out to them. I told them what I was up to, that I was a fledgling publisher, and that I just wanted to use an excerpt from some of their books. And they were all extremely gracious. It was pretty easy to get their uh, their publication rights, and I'm very, very grateful that uh, that they allowed me to do that. So you mentioned that people are pretty passionate about their stories. Why do you think that is? I think it's because when they go to the boundary waters, they take themselves out of modern everyday life and they put themselves into a wilderness area where they must be completely self-sufficient. Oftentimes you are two or three or four or six hours away from any help. You have to be totally self-sufficient. So it's, um, it's such a huge difference from the way most people live their lives that it's, those experiences create kind of an indelible mark in people's memories. They last for years. I heard from people who were, visited the Boundary Waters in 1947 and still had a story to tell and still remembered that tale. There's two stories in the book that stand out in my mind. Uh, the, fir- the first story was the very first story of the book about the father and the son and sort of, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was sort of like the, the, the last trip to the Boundary Waters where the father was kind of grew up in the Boundary Waters in the 50s and the 60s before the great change happened with all the visitors coming up. And then years later, the son said, Dad, you got to come back because things have changed. It's sort of back to the old ways. Uh, I really like that story. Yeah, that story is uh, is by an author and storyteller from Ely, Minnesota. He goes by the name of Iron Mike Hillman, and he is a uh, an absolute gem uh, of of a guy with incredible historical memory and experience about the Boundary Waters. His tale about what the Boundary Waters was like in the early days and how the locals treated it. And then a subsequent change, there was a magazine article in 1966 in a, in a defunct magazine called Argosy, which got uh, generated huge amounts of traffic. New people found out about this gem and they uh, they traveled in huge numbers. At that time, you could use motors there. The locals didn't. The locals paddled it. But the newcomers brought in motorboats and really really changed it. And Mike Hillman talked about how talked about wrote about how that changed his father's perception, sort of ruined the boundary waters that this guy was used to. Again, this was really pre boundary waters. But as you said, he later convinced his dad to come back after 1978, after motors were outlawed. And his father was pretty elderly at that time. And it was his dad's last trip into the Boundary Waters. And his dad thanked him for that gift, for bringing him back to the experience of what he knew uh, as, a, as a much younger man. It's a beautiful, 
beautifully written story. Yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic. The other story that that I enjoyed was written by a guy named Barry Johnson. Was that you? The yeah. Finlander? Yeah, that was my... I've been... Uh, I've had easily more than 30 trips to the Boundary Waters, and that was probably one of the most unusual ones. And <laughs> in a nutshell, we had uh, uh, four guys. We were going to, we had our permit. We were going to go up and go into the Boundary Waters, into a certain lake. We were fishing for lake trout. We had never done that before. And we were in a, in a breakfast diner in Grand Marais, uh, looking at a map, talking about the trip, and a stranger came up and, to make a long story short, invited himself to join us. We debated the pros and the cons, and we decided we would invite him along with us. He was a veteran lake trout fisherman, and it was a, an amazing trip. But it's kind of weird to invite a stranger along on a wilderness journey. Yeah, like you, you say, uh, is it, you know, is he an axe murderer or what? Who knows? Yeah, we at one point... After he uh, had suge- you know, invited himself, we, we had a mini debate in front of him, and I said, hey, everybody, hold on. We need to go out and have a crew meeting in the parking lot. And we did that. We left the guy in the restaurant. We went out, and we did the pros and the cons, and we decided, what the heck? This could be great. Let's go for it. And we went back in and invited the Finlander to join us, and the rest is history. We caught a lot of lake trout that we probably would have never caught without this stranger's counsel and advice and um and his presence great story hey if you don't mind i i'd like to read a short quote from a story that was put in it's called one less duck by roxanne oh brother that's a hard last name to pronounce chilowski yeah yeah so anyway the, (laughs) the, the quote is My BWCA trips leave me with a wonderful memory of beauty, peace, the wonder of nature, the appreciation of hard physical work, and the joy of friendship. I just thought that quote just kind of captured everything that not only this book is about, but the BWCA is about. Yeah, hers is a great story. She was sitting on a rock at sunset. The lake is perfectly calm. And here comes a a duck with a series of ducklings paddling quickly behind her. And right in front of her eyes, a massive fish comes and with one gulp swallows one of the ducklings. But, you know, you mentioned her quote about uh, the hard work of going to the Boundary Waters. And there was another line that was written about the peculiar sleep of exhaustion and when you go to the Boundary Waters, you're typically carrying big Duluth packs, say 60 pounds, with all of your gear in it, and you're flipping a canoe onto your shoulders. If it's an aluminum canoe, it's about 75 pounds. If it's a Kevlar, it's about 40 pounds. But you paddle, you carry over the portage, you paddle, you carry. And you might do that for six hours, and... Somebody wrote about the peculiar sleep of exhaustion because that's absolutely what you feel after a journey in that difficult. What do you remember about your first trip to the Boundary Waters? You know, I remember a, a couple of things very distinctly. It was uh, in June, and it happened to be during a drought year. It was very hot, so it was unusually hot. We did some swimming on that trip. The other thing I remember is that the smallmouth bass were spawning and the females were extremely aggressive. And so the technique was to paddle around the shoreline and cast uh, a rapala or a plug toward the shoreline. If a spawning female smallmouth was there, as soon as your, um, as soon as your uh, bait hit the water, that bass would attack it with a really violent surface strike. And I just remember how fun and exciting the fishing was. That's not like that every time, but we hit it that time. So you're a fisherman, and that's one of the themes that comes up in the book. But I think when people think about boundary waters, at least for me, I instantly just think canoe, canoe trips. But reading the book, there's other other ways that people use the the park up there. There's 
the story about backpacking. There's a story involving dog sledding. So it's not just canoeing, not just fishing. Yeah, the, you know, the primary thing is canoeing and kayaking. But there are uh, hikers who hike trails certainly around the edges of the boundary waters. There's a great uh, story of a guy trying to hike in the early Minnesota spring and essentially being lost in a snowstorm. Um, so I would say hiking, paddling, kayaking, and yeah, in the winter, dog sledding. Barry, another one of the themes in the book is animal encounters. Uh, what can you tell me about that? Well, Paul, it's a wilderness area, so there's plenty of animals. And, of course, the most famous critter in the Boundary Waters is the black bear. So we have plenty of stories about black bears raiding food, raiding uh, food packs, um, drinking 7-Up from bottles. Uh, but there's also some other stories. People have seen cougar lynx. Um, and there's a great story about a fellow who was on a solo trip in the fall and ran into a moose in the rut. So if you can imagine being alone in the wilderness and having a thousand pound animal with a huge rack come trotting right into camp, this guy had, uh, had prepared a plan, which was to take two leaps to the water and dive in if the moose charged him. So there's plenty of animal encounters in the Boundary Waters. Now that you bring that up, I do remember the story of, was it the red squirrel or a chipmunk or something that took all the person the group's candy bars and scattered? Yeah, that, <laughs> that was a great story about a, a red squirrel. This group liked to bring in candy bars, and every night after dinner, they would open up their pack, and they'd each get a candy bar. That was their treat for the night. Well, at one point, when their food pack was on the ground and they were their backs were turned to it, this red squirrel decimated their candy bar <laughs> stash and ate, like, took three-quarters of their candy bars away from them. It's a really fun, well-written story. Yeah, that was another great one. What advice, Barry, do you have for someone that wants to go to the Boundary Waters for the first time? My advice would be that if you are not a wilderness camper, if you're not used to being in the outback and, and being away from any help and being completely self-sufficient, you should absolutely work through an outfitter. There's plenty of them. You can just Google DWC outfitters and you'll find plenty of them. Even if you are an experienced wilderness camper, if this is your first time in the Boundary Waters, I would suggest working through an outfitter so you get oriented, you get advice on the type of trip you need or you want, uh, and you get advice on the sorts of gear that you will need in the Boundary Waters that you might not be used to bringing on other trips. So if you're a first-timer and your intention was to go solo, is, do you think that's a good idea? If you were a first-timer and you wanted to take a solo trip to the Boundary Waters, I would say it'd be a fantastic idea as long as you're a fairly experienced camper <laughs> and you work through an outfitter. Good advice. You know, Paul, I would say this, that um, the idea of being self-sufficient is really appealing, and people do that in a lot of different ways, but when, when you, everything you need is carried in on a backpack and your canoe is your sole means of transportation in and out, and your paddles are your essential means of propulsion, it just becomes a very compact, really cool way to live your life for a few days. You're subject to all the elements of weather. You're on your own in terms of the terrain that you need to cover. And, you know, if you, if you were to be injured, there's no quick fix. You have to get out the way you got in. There's no way to really get any, any rapid help in the Boundary Waters. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think it's easy to romanticize the idea, especially when you look at all the great photographs that are out there. But the reality is, like you say, it's big wilderness and you're out there by yourself, and it could be hours uh, before you can make it to the next uh, available person that can help you. 
you know, I learned that firsthand um, this August. I went in with, uh, with some friends. We were about four hours in from where our car was. And the night before we were going to leave, I twisted my ankle. Or at least I thought I did. In the morning, I woke up and I realized this might be more serious than a twisted ankle. It turned out I had broken a bone in my foot. And we, I struggled on the way out. I had some painkillers, which I took. Uh, I had some friends who helped carry the gear, but I didn't know I had a broken foot. And I was carrying a backpack on the way. I didn't carry the canoe, but I did carry backpacks on the way out. I made myself a walking staff. Uh, and I and I I made my way out, but you know other people have had really serious issues in the Boundary Waters, anything from a heart attack to a broken bone to a fish hook um, embedded in their in their hand or their face, and those are very serious incidents when you're hours away from any help. Is there a plan for a digital edition of the book? You know, I'm still uh, I'm still working on. I just have the physical copies right now. And I don't really have any plans for a, a digital version of the book at this point. But if demand were there and, uh, and I could see that, I might explore a digital copy. How can people purchase the book? Well, the best way to purchase the book is to go to www.bwcareader.com. It's available for purchase online. In the Twin Cities... There's a few outlets that are carrying it. Um, McCauber's book in St. Paul carries it. In Ely, it's available at Paragis Outfitters, very famous outfitters in Ely. And then in Grand Marais, it's available at the Lake Superior Trading Post. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. I really enjoyed reading it, and uh, you did a nice job putting it together. I appreciate that. I had It was a labor of love. Oh, so Barry, what's next for you? What's next for uh, the BWCA reader? Well, you know, I've, I've received a lot of inquiries from people who either uh, who read the book, also those who wrote for the book, and I've received a lot of interest in a volume two, which I would love to do. But again, this is a, a self-published effort on my part, and uh, I need to sell through volume one and at least break even. But I believe there's a, there's a, a lot more stories to tell about the Boundary Waters, and I'd love to do that in a volume, too. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, the best way to get a hold of me would be to email me, bwcareader at gmail.com. Okay, Barry Johnson, publisher of BWCA Reader. Thank you very much for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it, and good luck with the book, and good luck with your next trip to the Boundary Waters. Paul, thank you very much. It was great talking to you. You're welcome. Recorded October 2, 2013. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. <laughs>